So in your notes, I want us to consider a situation of an interesting type of medium. So I want you to draw the medium twice. It's this rectangular block. Draw it once here and a second time here. And I've shaded it like this because the index of refraction of this medium changes. At the top, it has a very large index of refraction. So we can say it's very optically dense. And then it decreases in a continuous fashion with its index of refraction down to the bottom towards a much smaller index. And I want you to consider what happens, how light would pass through here. So I've drawn two rays of light, one entering at the top edge, one entering at the bottom edge. And I want you to pause the video. I want you to see if you can trace the path of light through this block in these two different situations. If you need a little bit of nudge in the right direction, you might want to think about, well, first what the light does when it first enters the block, and then what happens as it goes down the block this way or up the block this way in like layers of the block as it changes the index refraction in incremental ways. So we'll start with the block on the left. And so it enters here, so I'm going to draw a normal. We're thinking about Snell's Law. So we say, okay, it's going from the air into this medium with a large index of refraction. So is the light speeding up or slowing down? Well, sure, it's slowing down. It's going to a large index. It's optically dense. So when it slows down, is that bending towards the normal or away from the normal? Towards the normal. And since it's a very large index of refraction, it's slowing down by quite a lot. So it's going to be a pretty drastic change here. So, you know, I really exaggerated. I made it go very much closer to the normal there. I'm not sure how much you did, but something like that. Okay? But then, as soon as it enters the block and starts to move down into it, well, the index of refraction changes. So again, think of it like another layer. Draw another, another, sort of like a boundary there and a normal. They're both kind of imaginary, so I drew them as dashed lines. And then what happens in this next layer? Well, the index is now getting a little bit smaller. So the index is getting a little bit smaller. It's getting a little bit faster. And so if it's getting a little bit faster. Does it bend towards the normal or away from the normal? Well, now it bends away from the normal, but only a little bit. So something maybe like that. And so if you were having a little bit of trouble, maybe now you want to pause the video and proceed from here to see what you think is going to happen. And so working on this sort of layer model, now it enters another layer, and every single time it goes to a, just a slightly smaller index refraction, so it gets to a little bit of a faster speed, so it just bends a little bit more away from the normal. So it's going to be a whole bunch of these arrows, all slightly bending slightly away from the normal. In the end, it would actually form sort of a curved path. Now it depends here on how uh, deep you drew your block and how you made it curved, but it should look something like this, and I, I was intending for it to exit at the bottom of the block, so you can adjust yours accordingly. But it doesn't stop there, it keeps going. Like, why would it stop? It keeps going, and now it's going to exit into the air, and so now it's going from a small index of refraction to the air, but we don't even have to think about it. We know what's going to happen. If here it started in air, goes through all of this, and it ends in air, well, we've already done a problem like this. We know what happens. If it starts in one medium and ends in the same medium, it's going to exit at the exact same angle it entered, right? We show, we show that in problem six. And so here it's going to exit parallel to its entrance speed. Okay, and so if you need help with this one, we'll maybe now pause the video and try a similar idea here for the right-hand one. So we're going to break it down. So we're again thinking about this as a refraction problem. So we draw our normal, and the light is going from air into a very small index. Now, no matter what the index is here at the bottom edge of this block, it's going to be something larger than one, because there's something there's really more in the way of the light than there is in air. So it's a small number, but it's something larger than one. So what's the light doing as it goes from the air into the block? Well, it's slowing down. So is that bending towards or away from the normal? That's towards, but it's going to be a very minor change. So maybe draw just a slight decrease of that angle towards the normal. But as soon as it enters the block and starts to rise up into the block, well, what happens to the index of refraction? It starts to increase. So the index increases, so that means it's getting faster or slower. It means it's getting slower. So is that bending towards the normal or away from the normal? That's towards, but it's going to be a, an incremental amount, right? So here's like the next layer, there's the, there's the boundary, there's the normal, and so it's going to bend a little bit towards the normal. And you can proceed like this, it's just going to keep getting more and more towards the normal little by little, but eventually you can sort of smooth out all those little arrows into one curved path. And that's what happens. If this is a continuous change in index of refraction, the light's path will actually curve. What's going to happen when it reaches the upper edge? Well, again, it's not going to stop. It is going to come out. But I think we should know what happens. If it starts in air and ends in air, we know it's going to exit parallel to its entrance ray at the same angle from the normal. Fantastic. Now, it's a bit of a contrived example, but we actually can see it happen in our everyday lives. So let's imagine one day after school, you decide to take a walk. It's a nice sunny day, so let's draw a picture. There's you, <laughs> enjoying nature. 
and off in the distance we'll draw a tree. And you're looking at the tree, enjoying its beauty, and let's say you're looking at the top of the tree. Now, the top of the tree is all these bunch of leaves, which is not a, a smooth surface at all. So sunlight is hitting the top of the tree and bouncing off in every which direction. We call that diffuse reflection. And if we want to see the leaf from the top of the tree, well, that means that we look at one ray of light that hits the top of the tree, bounces off, and then goes into your eye. And so here's one ray of light we're using to see the top of the tree. Fantastic. Now, I did say it's a beautiful, sunny day. And since it's been sunny for a while, that means that the ground has absorbed the sunlight and then transforms it into heat energy. And then it re-radiates it to heat the air right above the ground. And so right above the ground, we have relatively warm air. I say fast because warm air is particles that are relatively far apart from each other. It's not very dense, and so the light doesn't have a lot to interact with. And so it, warm air is basically a relatively faster medium than maybe not warm air. But of course, you know from previous science classes, what happens to warm air? Well, warm air rises. And what happens that warm air as it rises, you probably remember, it cools down. So if it cools down, now these particles are a little bit closer to each other than they were before. What does that do to light in terms of how fast it can move? Well, now if it's a little bit denser air, there's, a, there's more things in that same amount of space for the light to go through, so it relatively slows down. So cooler air has a relatively slower speed for light. And then you know what happens, the cool air sinks down, it warms up, and there's the convection currents. We're not going to deal with all that. But the whole point is, we have different layers of air and the light's going at different speeds in those different layers, slow up here and fast over here. So if we go back to the top of the tree, we look at a ray of light that hits the top of the tree and then maybe goes off in this direction. Well, now it's going down through these different layers of air, starting in a relatively slow layer of air. And then as soon as it starts to go down through, it's getting faster and faster and faster, which you should be able to see is this situation over here. Right? This is a large index of refraction, and over here is a small index. And so the light is going to arc. It's going to curve in its path. And then what happens, well, then it actually sort of connects with this and starts to do this, going back up through the air, arcing this way. So in the end, this ray of light is actually going to follow a path that curves in this way and then goes back up into your eye. And this is a ray of light that started over here at the top of the tree. Now, remember, when it comes to light, humans are easily fooled, right? And so your brain thinks this ray of light comes at you in a straight line. So your brain naturally traces it backwards, and you will actually see an image of the top of the tree here on the ground. But your brain naturally sort of traces it backwards, so you see the image sort of like this. You will see an image of the ground upside down. So I drew a sort of the hazy picture of the tree there. You may know what this is called. This is a mirage. Mirages are not imaginary things. They actually happen. Now, of course, it's just an image, but this actually happens. You can notice this any time at the end of the day, if you're going home on the bus, for example, and it's been sunny for a, uh, for a lot of the day, even when it's cold outside, it doesn't matter. As long as it's been sunny and the ground absorbs the heat, absorbs the sunlight and transforms into heat, you'll actually be able to see this idea. Usually, if you're going maybe over a hill and down into a valley, you look off in the distance, you should be able to see what looks like sort of a, a ripply image of something that is beyond. You're seeing the light come at you through this heated air. It changes direction. Your brain traces it back and you see an image of that object upside down on the ground. Then as you approach it, it goes away. It was a mirage. Now what's the classic example of seeing mirage? It's usually our weary traveler off in the desert, right? They lost their camel, they lost their canteen, they're suffering maybe from heat stroke, and off in the distance, what do they see? Ah, a pool of water. How does that happen? Well, if we look back at this picture here and just remove the tree from the picture, we can see light from the sky, from the blue sky, goes through this path and gets to your eye. Your eye naturally traces it backwards, and you see an image of the blue sky on the ground, which you interpret as water, and that's where the mirage comes from. So it's a very real effect that produces an imaginary image.